Welcome to Vertical Church, everybody. If you're new here, my name is Pastor Verge. I'm honored that you would be here to worship with us and lean into God's word. I was praying for everybody today, and I prayed specifically, Lord, if anybody comes to church and they're spiritually hungry and want to, Lord, fill them, and may they receive today. So I prayed for you. And if anybody came kind of like not expecting anything, I said, Lord, blow their minds for not expecting anything. And if anybody came in a little special, like a little complicated, you know, because sometimes we have complicated days, I prayed, Lord, pinch them in the butt so hard that they would have no doubt that it was you speaking to their hearts. Can I get an amen? Get comfortable in your chair now. Any Christians got their Bibles at Vertical Church? I'm just curious if any Christians have their Bibles at Vertical Church. Come on. I love it. Thank you for bringing it. Got to love God's word. You got to know God's word. You got you to have it close. Uh, if you don't, we'll have the verses on the screens. But if you have it, put a marker in 1 John 3. 1 Corinthians 3, Luke 19. I got so many Bible verses that it's going to be really, really hard to kind of open up to each one. So A, uh, you can follow on the screens uh, when, when you don't have time to get there. B, our Vertical Church Iglesia app <clears throat> usually has all the verses and the notes as well. Um, and, and I want to just encourage you. So 1 John 3, 1 Corinthians 3, Luke 19. We are in a series called Grow and Flourish. Um, last week we kicked it off um, talking about there's many ways and areas in which we can grow and flourish. We tend to pay more attention to the visible, tangible areas of our lives. Uh, sometimes we forget about or often neglect the invisible, intangible areas like the spiritual. And, um, and so our key verses for the whole series, we unpacked it last week, is Psalm 92.12. You, you can find it on the screens because I didn't, I didn't tell you to look for it. Psalm 92.12, and it says, The righteous will flourish like a palm tree, they will grow like a cedar of Lebanon, planted where? Planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green. And so what we, what we did last week is we talked about this idea that in order to grow and flourish, you need the right environment and the right conditions. And last week's message was church a place to flourish. <clears throat> and that's our, our prayer and our responsibility here as pastors and leaders at Vertical is to, is to um, promote an environment where flourishing and growing can happen in your spiritual walk and for your family. And what that needs is the right conditions and it needs the right environment. And so part of what I'm doing in this series is unpacking how and why we do church the way we do it here at Vertical. Okay, and I'm connecting it to the whole concept of growing and flourishing. Why? Because not every church is created equal. Every church is a little bit different, kind of like restaurants. They're not all the same. However, we want to make sure that we're, we're majoring on the majors and that we're clear on the important things. Now, we have a clear mission and vision. God's vision and mission is our vision and mission. So I'm going to put them on the screens. Here's the four things we want to help people do because we see this all throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, over and over in different ways, God wants these four things to happen in people's lives. Number one, know God. Number two, Find freedom. Number three, if we can help me on production, discover purpose. And number four, make a difference. Help me out. Number one, know God. Number two, find freedom. Number three, and number four, this, God wants these things for every single person. Now, today's message, we're going to focus in on the first one, on know God, okay? The title of today's message is Salvation, the Seed of the Gospel. Salvation, <clears throat> the Seed of the of the gospel. We're going to be focusing in on the first part of knowing God because the truth is you can't even go to find freedom or discover purpose or make a difference until you first truly begin to know God. So is it okay if we pray to begin today's service? By the way, here's what I'm going to do symbolically. I'm going to take the seed from God's word and I'm going to throw it out right now. Right now. And let me tell you, the seed is good. It's not a question of if the seed is good. The question is, how is the soil in your heart? By the way, we're going to expand on that next week. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word, because today your word will speak to our hearts. I pray, Lord, that we will be attentive, receptive, and I pray that the seeds from your word would land in good soil in every heart. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So, so let's start off here. First birth, then growth. Help me out. First birth, then growth. So we, we understand from many of Jesus' parables that he uses illustrations and examples from the natural world to help teach and explain spiritual principles in a way that we can understand. And it is clear throughout God's word that he wants us to grow. However, before growth, there must be 
birth. Okay? Jesus often speaks about a seed. I have one here. I have a sunflower seed, right? He, he often speaks about a seed. Why? Because a seed gives way to a new birth. We've been talking about that since Easter here. Uh, new life. That's where everything starts. So I want to show you a verse, 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. It's talking here about children of God. And just look at the terminology. It says, no one who is born of God. Born of who? Born of God, so that's spiritually, will continue to sin. Because God's seed, other versions say God's life, remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been, here it is, born of God. So what we're seeing here is that there's something that happens in a person's life where there's a before and an after. The Bible talks about being born again. The Bible talks about new life in Christ. The Bible talks about a seed. And it talks about here in 1 John 3 that a person who is born of God, will not. another version says, will not continue to practice sin. So it doesn't mean that as Christians that we no, we no longer sin. There's going to be moments where we sin, we break God's heart, God's law, God's word. But, but the difference is we don't, we don't live practicing sin because we come and we repent of it and we say, God, forgive me, please. This is not your heart, this is not what I should be doing. Please forgive me, and we don't want to keep walking. That's called repentance. That's turning away from sin, turning back to God. Are you following me? So somebody who's been born of God doesn't, doesn't justify continuing to live in sin, okay? So let me give you the, 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 the illustration. So we'll put them on the screen. The seed represents the gospel. The seed is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is, it is what has the potential to birth in a person new life, being born again in Christ. The soil, the seed is the gospel. What's the soil? <laughs> It's our hearts. It's where, the seed, it's where the seed is supposed to land for it to give fruit, for it to, for it to bring a transformation. The water is God's word. The more we get God's word in us, the more it fills us and, 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 and nourishes us. And the light is God's presence. If we're using the illustration of, of, of plant, right, of growth and flourishing, right? So the seed of the gospel, by the way, who is the seed of the gospel available to? It's available to everybody. That's God's heart. And what is God's desire is that hearts would be fertile so his seed can grow in us. God wants you to grow. Pastor, where does it say that God wants us to grow? All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Thanks for asking. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. Now, this is a whole conversation that Paul, Paul writes this letter to the Corinthian church, and they're talking about, well, who's more important? And Paul's just saying, hey, listen, we all do our part, but God is the one ultimately who wants you to grow. And it says, after all, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? We are only God's servants through whom you believed the good news, the gospel. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted the seed, says Paul, in your hearts, because maybe he shared the message of the gospel. He preached it. And Apollos watered it, because maybe he shared some more, or taught a group study, or a Bible study, or a life group. But it was God who made it what? Grow. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. The one who plants and the one who waters work together with the same purpose, and both will be rewarded for their own hard work. For we are co-workers in God's service, and you are God's field, you are God's building. Here's a, a point to add here. The growth, who does it come from? It comes from God. And, and guess what? God uses his people in the process to help other people grow. Can I get an amen? But it is clear that before there is growth, there must be birth. And, and why is, ask me why this is important. Ask me, ask me, ask me. Because there are so many people who have not been born again. Okay? They may know about God, but they don't know God. They may be good people, but they're still not saved. They may want to be saved, but they're still lost. So let's talk about the lost and the found. Come on, say it with me. The lost and the found. The lost and the found. I'm going to give you three sub points here. Number one, Jesus came on a mission to save the lost. The Bible says that God, that God the Father sent God the Son, Jesus, to this earth on a divine mission. When you have a mission, that gives you focus and that gives you direction. Jesus describes his own mission. Where, Pastor? Luke 19. Check it out. Luke 19, verse 10. Jesus is speaking of himself and he says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. Pause. Do you need a Bible degree to understand Jesus' mission in Luke 19, 10? Do you need a master's degree in theology? What is, his, what is his mission? Jesus came to seek and save who? The lost. Now, we know that Jesus is the son of God, but here he comes, calls himself the son of man, capital M. Why? Because we understand that Jesus is fully God and fully man. He's God in the flesh. That's what we call, is known doctrinally as incarnation. 
God put on flesh and came to earth as a man through Jesus, right? Why is it important to us that he is the son of man? Because it means that he can identify with everything that you and I go through in life. There is not a single thing that I will go through or that you will go through that Jesus has not gone through and experienced. That's why Hebrews 4.15 says, this high priest, speaking of Jesus, of ours, understands our weaknesses. Why? For he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So God came into our world to identify with us. He knows everything we've been through. The only difference between Jesus and us is that he never never sinned. Number two, so many people are spiritually lost. How many people? So many people. So many people. In fact, at one point, every single one of us here was lost if we're found right now. How do, where, where does that come from? Isaiah 53, 6. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. So here it is. Listen to me. Lostness is a common condition. Without God, a person is lost. I'm not talking about a lady on the corner trying to figure out where Walmart is. I'm talking about spiritually. Are you following me? So what, what do lost people need most? They need to be found. From God's perspective and point of view, there are only two types of people in this world, spiritually speaking. There are lost people and there are found people. According to the Bible, the lost are those people who have not yet been found. The Bible also refers to them as unsaved, ungodly, under the evil one, in darkness, without hope, without God in this world. What are they? They are lost. They simply have not come to know God. And despite whatever success they've had in life or achieved in this world, spiritually they are still in darkness. Their eyes have not been opened to the truth and light of Jesus and therefore the seed of the gospel has not yet sprung life in their hearts. They are spiritually lost. Now the found. The found were people who once were lost, but now they're found. <clears throat> also in the Bible known as saved, converted, redeemed, justified. It's those people who have no, not only come to know of God, but who have also accepted and confessed Jesus as their Lord and their Savior they are those who have acknowledged their sins and their need for forgiveness and a savior. They've repented of those sins and they are developing a personal relationship with the Lord. God's light has come to their lives, opened their eyes, replaced the darkness, and the seed of God, the seed of the gospel, has taken life in their hearts. Now, here's the tricky part. And, and, and it's, not about like, it's not about like, oh, my opinion, or, well, pastor, what do you think? Because here's a good question. Are there more lost people, or are there more found people? And, and again, it's not a matter of, well, people are generally good. We're not talking about good. We're talking about lost and found. We're talking about saved or unsaved, because there's good people who are found and good people who are lost. There's bad people who are <laughs> found and found people who are lost, right? B uh, bad people. Bad people who are found, bad people who are lost. But when they become found, they, they, they find a new path. Same thing. So, so the interesting thing is what Matthew 7 says. Just look at it right here. Matthew 7, verse 13. Jesus himself says this. He says, enter. Jesus says, I want to give you some advice. Enter through the narrow gate. Which gate? The narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. How many? How many enter the way that leads to destruction? Many, many. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, eternal life. And only, how many, how many? A few find it. So where is the majority? Is it in the lost or the found? It's in the lost. And so this, this should concern us if we're believers. When it comes to the spiritual dimension of life, it's important to remember that without God, we are all lost, now check it out. Here's the thing about lost people. Some people are lost and they know it and they're enjoying being lost. Because I don't want nothing about God. I love, being, I love being lost. Some people are lost, but they don't know they're lost. And some people are lost and they actually think they're found. By the way, who determines this? It's not a pastor. It's not a church. It's not, you know, the president. It's not a government. This is a personal relationship. And so <clears throat> without 
his active presence and guidance in our lives, you and I are operating blindly and basing our life decisions on our best knowledge, which is limited. The Bible is very clear about a false assurance that we get if we're not careful, thinking that we got our lives together. So sometimes we think we got our lives together. Why? Because maybe we got a job. Or maybe things are going pretty good. I'm healthy. Um, I'm reaching some goals. And ultimately, I'm a good person. So that, that, that's a, there's a false assurance of, I'm good. That means I'm going to go to heaven. That means I'm good with God. As if, as if good works open the door to heaven. As if my behavior is what earns me something. And that's why Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that appears right. How does it appear? It appears right, but in the end, it leads to what? To death. There's a, listen, listen to me. That's, this is why there's so many lost people. In this auditorium right now, m- many of you are lost. I love that you're here because you're being exposed here to, to the truth of the gospel. And some of your family members and friends have been praying and praying for the soil in your heart. And we have been praying. Even if we don't know you, we've been praying for the soil of your heart. Now, we can't make the decision for you. We can't force you into it. Now, we can, we can encourage it. We can model it. We can pray for you. But ultimately, God opens the door and he offers the gift. But it's up to you if you want to receive it or not. Now, here's the thing. A lot of people think, <laughs> they think they're on the right way. But it ends, to, it ends in death. There's a road that you can get on in life that you think you're going in the right direction. But listen, listen. You think you know the destination because it seems right to you. But in the end, it's wrong. Why? Because we have this limited capacity, limited ability, and limited knowledge, and we tend to make decisions, check it out, in life, based on what's good for our existence here on earth. We have such a short vision because all we think about, generally speaking, human beings, is this life. So we think about, where can I find pleasure? What's most comfortable for me? What do I want? How do I want it? When do I want it? And how can I get it now? Because we're thinking about this life. Now, there's nothing wrong with enjoying things of this life. However, there is something wrong if you're living for this life alone with no real thought to the next life, which is eternity. 70 years, eternity. 85 years. So, 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 so many people think about this little piece of the rope, but they don't think about the whole piece of the rope. Are you, are, you, are you hearing me? So some people think <laughs> it's like the guy that, that was going to go up and paint the building. And there was multiple ladders, and then he went up, and when he got to the top, he realized that he went on the wrong ladder because it was leaning against the wrong building. Right? So you got to think about in life, what ladder are you on? Because you might think you're headed to heaven. You might think you're headed to God, to the good thing, but you might be on the wrong ladder, and that's why this message is so important. Number three. Jesus is the only way to be found. Jesus is the only way to be found. Praise God for one amen and a half of a yeah in the front here. Um, that's all right, that's all right, that's all right. You don't have to get excited. I'll, I'll get excited for my amen, pastor. Jesus is the only way to be found. There is actually a cure for lostness. And the, lo- the cure for lostness is to be found in Jesus Christ to find the right way to live. Here's here's how it happens. Jesus finds you, you find Jesus, and you discover the purpose that he's given you for your life. But most people are looking for answers in all the wrong places. Popularity, power, possessions, positions, money, relationships, sex, satisfaction in the moment, pleasure, even religion. But none of those things will lead to God and none of those things will lead to heaven. That's why so many people are deceived and they think they're on the right road, but they're on a road that leads to a wrong destination. Why? Because maybe they have money. Why? Because they have some success. And, and that's why we read, look, look what Jesus says in Mark eight thirty four. He says, then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, if any of you wants to be my follower, if you want to follow me, Jesus says, you must give up your own way. That, that's the hardest thing for people, I think. You got to give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you're going to lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, the gospel, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, if you have all this stuff, but you lose your soul? And look what he asks. Jesus asks, is anything worth more than your soul? (laughs) When you pursue the wrong things in life, you may gain the world, but lose your soul. And tell me, what have you won? Nothing. What have you lost? Everything. Everything. Is, Jesus asks, is anything worth more than your soul? The answer is no. And that's why I feel a passion and I feel an urgency. Like, the, the, like this morning, the, the Holy Spirit put an urgency in my, in, my, in my heart, you know, not for everybody. 
and I, and I speak to the church in general, but I speak to everybody because I know that sitting before me and connected online, there are some found and there are some lost. And the problem is that there's so many that are lost, but they don't even know they're lost. And I, and I look at the younger generation because it seems that each next generation is more lost than the previous. And it shouldn't be a surprise because half the time when I look at the kids and then I look at the parents, there's no, there's no question why they're lost because the parents are loster than them. I just made up a word. That's what happens. You get inspired. But, 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 but it, it, it irks me because I see, sometimes I see, and I'm going to pick on the young people. I see young people coming to church like, uh, uh, picking your nose, not even knowing. You don't realize you have the opportunity of life in front of you. Life is in front of you. But then I, but then I, but then I, I realize that that's how mom and dad are. Who, uh, like the car is more important than, than eternity. And there's a disbalance. There's not a view of, of what's truth and, and what matters most. What matters most is not how many soccer games your child played. What matters most is that he knows Jesus. And so, and so here's, we've lost the urgency for the gospel. And so here, okay, I shouldn't have come to this church. The pastor screams. I'm not screaming because I'm angry. I'm screaming because I'm passionate. Check this out. Check this out. I'm going to see if you would scream in this situation. So check it out. Let's say that your three-year-old daughter is in the street, and you see really far over there a big Mack truck. It's far. It's far. But your daughter's in the street. I'm not talking about the other neighbor kid that you don't like. It's your daughter. And the, car, the truck is way far. It's over there. But still, what do you do? Honey. Weenie. Maybe you should come inside. And that, now, now, now you can hear the truck. Oh. Now you can hear the truck. Your three-year-old daughter's in the street. So what do you do? Oh, sweetie, I know you like to play in the street, but it's time to come on in now, baby. Honey. Now, the lights are blaring. Your child is in the street. The truck is coming. What is your approach? Honey, baby, if you think it's good now, maybe you can come inside. I know you're your own person. I know, you're, I know you're capable of deciding everything in your life. You're three. Is, is, that, is that real life? Some of you with a bike on the other side would be like, get inside of him. Get out of the street. A truck coming. Truck can kill you. Will kill you dead. And it is my responsibility to keep you alive. A person's brain isn't, brain isn't fully formed until they're 25, and we have parents thinking, well, I'm gonna let my child decide if they believe or don't believe. Believe it or not, no wonder they're so messed up. There's no urgency. If your child is in the street and a truck is coming, you run and you get them and you scream, hey, get out of the street. Let me tell you, there's a truck coming. Satan is after everybody, and death is is after everybody, and there's only two places. There's heaven and there's hell. And, but I was a good person. I jumped rope every day. I don't like those pastors who scream. I'm not, I'm not, listen. Sometimes when somebody's in the street and the truck is coming, you gotta scream. Because check it out, if you weren't there, and your child was in the street, would you want me to be like, hey, hey, little buddy? Or would you want me to tell him, go grab him, and tell him, hey, there's a truck coming. If you don't get out of the way, you're going to die. And, and that's why whenever somebody new comes to church, I'm thinking, who was praying so that he would be here today? Who was praying so that she would be here today? So that maybe they would alert and waken to the fact because we live in a culture and a generation, listen to me, in a culture and generation now that it's so easy, it's like, oh, well, you choose your own way. Every way is good. All the ways are good. They're, as long as you're a good person and you don't harm anybody and you tolerate people and you enjoy everything, everything's okay. No, and Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Ain't nobody going to Papa unless it's through me. Again, Jesus is very clear. People think, oh, that's in top. Well, it's just clear. Like, like, here's the reality, everybody. 
in this building, there's only three exits. One, two, and three. Maybe, oh, four. There's two doors in the front. That's what there is. But do you want me to tell you there's 10? Don't worry, there's 10. No, there's only four. So find one of those. It would be a lie to tell you that there's more. And it would be a lie to say, if you believe in Jesus, that there's other ways. Jesus came on a mission to seek and save the lost. He is the answer. This is true for people in the world who the world considers good people. How many good people we have in the house? Oh, look at all these good people. Good people are lost until they find Jesus, and Jesus finds them. This is true for people that the world considers bad people, because there's bad people. Honestly, we're all bad, but there's bad, bad people. And bad people are lost, and Jesus can find them. They can find Jesus and turn them around. And this is true for people that the world considers broken. Broken people are lost, but Jesus can find them. They can find Jesus, and he can turn their life around. Here it is. When, you find Jesus, when, when Jesus finds you, and you find Jesus, you're no longer lost. You are found. And Jesus is more than a cool guy and a cool movie and a hippie Jesus. No. Jesus is not just a way. Jesus is the way. He is not just a truth. He is the truth. He is not a life. He is the life. There ain't no other exit. There ain't no other ladder. There ain't no other way. It's only Jesus. Well, I don't like that. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that, 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 that it's not your gospel. It's Jesus' gospel. And so, to be found is to receive the seed of the gospel in your heart. To be found is to be saved. God wants everyone to receive the seed of the gospel and be saved. How do we know that? 1 Timothy 2.3. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved. Who does he want to be saved? All people and to come to the knowledge, to know God, to know the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. So check it out. There's religion and there's relationship. We do not push, encourage, or preach religion. We push, encourage, and preach relationship. Check it out. The gospel is not about what you do. The gospel is about who you become because of what he did. Salvation is not about doing religion for God. Salvation is about being in relationship with God. Knowing God is not about having more information in your head. It's about experiencing transformation in your heart. Salvation is not earned or received by doing good work so that none of us can boast about it. Look at me, look what I did. No, salvation is only by grace. It is a gift of God and it's activated through faith when we believe. That's why Romans 1.16 says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who what? Everyone who believes. That's Romans 1.16. So to unpack this last portion, we want people to know God here at Vertical Church, if you can't tell. Um, so what is our system to help people know God? It's Sunday services. Everybody say Sunday. Sunday services is the way that we help people know God. Why? Ask me why. Ask me why. Because we believe that the local church is the gateway to heaven. Let me, let me, let me, show, you, let me show you why. Okay, if you accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ and you got saved by watching a TV preacher, a televangelist, just spoke the word, you were watching TV, and in that moment, that's when you made your decision to follow Jesus. Jesus found you there, and that was you. Raise your hand. I want to see how many people, a TV, TV salvation moment. Raise your hand. Okay, I don't see any. Last service, there was two. Previous service, one. Okay. If, if it was a radio, a radio preacher or pastor, you were listening to a radio program, maybe driving or at home, whatever, radio, uh, preaching, and the message, boom, just landed, and you just, you understood the gospel, you made a decision, you repented of your sin, I want Jesus to be my Savior. Raise your hand if that was you on the radio. One, two, two on the radio. Okay. Now, if for you, maybe if it was you, you were just home by yourself, you opened up the word of God, you decided to read, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit came alive, spoke to your heart, and you realized, maybe it was John 3, 16, and you read, and you were like, I need to surrender my life to Jesus. It was just happened by yourself. Nobody led you. Nobody guided you. It was just you. And you just raise your hand if that was you. Okay. No parents or other family involved. Okay. All right. All right. Good. Now, if you accepted Jesus as a result of somebody inviting you to church or to a small group where they were studying the Bible or the Word with other believers, raise your hand. Okay. So, so everybody look around. Keep your hand up and look around. Look around. Do you see it? Do you see it? The local church is the gateway 
to heaven. Praise God for the TV evangelists. Praise God for the radio preachers that come on. Praise God for his word that can speak to us anytime, anywhere, any place. Praise God for other ways. Some of you maybe didn't raise hand because maybe I didn't say the way that it was specifically for you. But, but did you guys see the, uh, the overwhelming 95% of people? And some of you haven't raised your hand because you haven't yet become a believer. And we're praying. We're praying that the, seed of, that the soil of your heart would be ready for this seed today. And that's okay because it's, it's God is a gentleman. He doesn't force his way in. But, 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 but we need to understand this is why church is important. Now, what do we do? What do we do? Here it is on the screens. We create Sunday worship experiences that both unchurched people and believers love to attend. Can I get an amen? Um, because if we don't get this right of getting people to know God, then we can't even worry about finding freedom or discovering purpose or anything else. So on Sundays, we pray that many people who are lost would come to church and that hopefully they would receive the seed of faith in their heart. We come to worship and to receive. So those who are not saved, we pray that they would become saved. And those who are saved, we pray that they would come ready to worship, ready to, to experience God's presence, and also to serve other people and help other people reach the opportunity to know God. Why do we do it? Three reasons. Here they are. Why do we do it? Because it's the biblical model. We see it in the Bible, the importance of the church uh, for the message of the gospel to be, to be transmitted. Secondly, because we as Christians are called to continue the ministry of Jesus. And what is that ministry? To help continue to seek, to save the lost. It's, it's, it's the great commission to disciple people. Number three, because heaven and hell are realities. Hello? That's why. And by the way, if all this is fake, what do you lose in getting your child to come out of the street when the truck is coming? You don't lose any. And if there's no truck coming, they're still going to be safe. But if it's true, there could be a big risk in not paying attention. The father's heart is for the lost. We see it. Luke 15 has the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, also known as the prodigal son. And we see that God will leave the 99 to find the one. We see that the father is distracted by the lost because he wants to find, for them to be found. We see that in heaven, all of heaven rejoices when one person, one sinner repents and comes to faith in Jesus. By the way, light doesn't exist for light. Light exists for darkness. Hello, hello. The church doesn't exist just for the church. Because some people, the ch type of church that they grew up in or, the, or, or what they kind of got trained in, they want church to be what they want. Oh, well, this church doesn't do what I want. The church is not for the church. The church is for the world. Yeah. Do you realize that? Yeah. Church is the only institution that exists for its non-members or its not yet members. Yeah. And that's why we always want to have seats. That's why we're telling people, hey, man, this service got a little heavier today. We got, we got to get some people into 10 to create some more space here so that you can still invite more friends and family members and people who need Jesus. Because there's so many people who need Jesus. And so we exist to shine the light of Jesus. How do we do it? How do we do it in our weekend services? How do we do it? Here it is. We focus on a life-giving culture. Everybody say life-giving. Culture is everything. And the reason that we want to be life-giving is because Jesus was life-giving. So if you ask me, why do we want to be life-giving? It's because Jesus was life-giving. How do we want our church to be? We want our church to be like Jesus. How should our services be? We want our services to be like Jesus. So let's talk about that. Our services are authentic here at Vertical Church. This is what we aim for for our services. Production can help me out. Our services are authentic. Why are our services authentic? Why do we want our church to be authentic? Why? Because Jesus was authentic, which means we're not here to be fake. There's no pomp. There's no pretense. You may have been to churches where they, it felt like there was some pomp or some pretense or some fakeness. We don't want to do that because we don't see that in Jesus. We, we, want to be, we don't want you to see uh, somebody here in church and then somebody else outside of church. That's not who Jesus was. He was the same where he was, wherever he was. And, and we want to be authentic. There's something beautiful about authenticity. Secondly, we want our services in our church to be relevant. Everybody say relevant. Relevant, relevant, relevant. Um, Jesus was relevant. You, do you realize that when he spoke, he reached people right where they were at? Because he didn't speak over their heads. He wasn't trying to blow them away with the next revelation that only three people could understand. Because that's what I want, deep. He, he, he came right to them. Hey, here's a seed. Like he spoke to them in language they understood. Why? Because he was relevant. You want another, another, another way of speaking about relevant here at church? If I have an itch here, don't scratch me here. Scratch me here. Being relevant is scratching where the itch is. 
And today, in culture and society, there's a lot of things happening. We need to speak to how does God's word apply in today's culture and society to what your kids are going through, to what you're going through in your marriage, to what's happening at work, to the challenges and struggles you're having and the temptations that you're fighting through. Like, what is God, how is it God's word relevant to you? It's not about being cool. Relevance is not cool. It's about what matters, and it's about scratching where the itch is. Are you following me? It's not cool. Like, like if I have a family of six, a porch, a Porsche isn't relevant to me, even though it's cool. What's relevant to me is a minivan or a big SUV, right? So, so we want to be a church that's relevant, that when people come, they feel like, wow, that really passed the who cares test. Because unfortunately, sometimes you go to some churches and it's like, Ooh, who cares? Nothing happened. A lot of religion, a lot of traditions sometimes will lead you to walk through motions, but nothing goes on in here. Our services are enjoyable, or at least I think they are. People, Amen. Man. Why? Why? Because Jesus was enjoyable. I mean, Jesus was enjoyable. Everybody loved Jesus. Sinners love Jesus. Skeptics, skeptics even love Jesus. Kids love Jesus. Like, like do, you want, do you know what it takes to become a kid magnet? Like, wherever Jesus was, the kids were there. It couldn't be like Jesus walking in like, children, all you children, I am Jesus. That's not how Jesus was. He, was probably, he probably had candies in his pocket. He's probably like, you're walking in. That's how you connect with kids. I, I, I love that. True story. Yesterday, we were in a restaurant, me and my wife and my three kids. There was a little girl in a little high chair right at my vision on the other table right over there. And I kept making funny faces at her the whole time. She was looking at me the whole time. And I just, I promise you that she left so happy because that funny man was keeping her entertained and, and loving her from a distance. And my wife was telling me, stop being so weird. People are going to be... <laughs> I'm just using it as an example. I'm thinking, Pastor Claudia, maybe we need a new vertical kids branch of funny faces for the kids when they walk in. Because they're used to going to places where people are all serious. Well, well you know, our, our services are enjoyable. Jesus was enjoyable. I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Psalm 122, verse 1. There should be laughter in church. There should be fun in church. There should be generosity in church. There should be creativity in church. We, we shouldn't be people that have to tolerate. I have to tolerate going to church. We don't, look, when, when, we don't want people to be checking their watch every 10 minutes thinking, like, when is this going to be over? We want people at the end of service to say, that's it? I'll come back. I'll come back next week. It was all right. It was all, it was all right. Oh, fine, I'll come back. <laughs> Our services are accepting. Check it out. Jesus was pure, holy, and perfect, but he wasn't afraid to embrace imperfect people. And his holiness didn't drive people away. It actually drew people to him, which was something that the, that the religious leaders of the time were so annoyed at, and they criticized him. He eats with sinners. Now, now check it out. Jesus didn't approve of their sinful lifestyle, but he accepted and loved them. And so here at our church, we will, we, will, we will receive anybody and everybody who wants to come in and hear the, the seed of the gospel. We're not here to bat them on the head with the Bible because that's what some churches feel like. We're here to embrace them. We're not going to approve of their sinful lifestyle. We will, we will address those things as we go, but we will pray that along with the love and the kindness of God, the seed of the gospel would land to lead them to a place where they say, I don't want to continue to live in my sin. Our services are powerful. Why? because Jesus was powerful. I don't know if you felt the presence of God here during worship time. We exalt thee. I don't know that those oldies sometimes pull out something extra. We exalt thee. We exalt you, Lord. Wherever Jesus was, things happened. People were healed, restored, transformed. We depend on the power and the presence of our God. So we have to know this as a church. We have to know this. And we are paying attention. We paid attention to some studies about the four top reasons why people don't like going to church. Number one, because services are boring. Isn't it true? It's rough to be somewhere that it's boring. Lord, help us not be boring. I think it takes work to make God's word boring. I think it's like you have to try because God's word is so alive. Second reason people don't come to church, don't, don't, like, don't like going to church because the members are unfriendly. And uh, so we turn that around here. I hear all the time from new people say, Pastor, what do you, like what kind of Kool-Aid are people drinking here? Because people are happy. People are, people are like, they feel like, like they're joyful. I thought it was fake. Some people told me the other day, I thought it was like fake, but then I kept coming back and everybody's, 
And, and our life isn't perfect. It doesn't mean we don't have challenges and trouble, but there's a genuine love for God and a genuine love for people in this place. Another reason why people, some people don't go to church, amen. Another reason why some people don't like to go to church, because the church just wants my money. And uh, unfortunately, because of the bad example of a few, then some people use that as, a, that as an excuse, you know. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab onto that. And, um, and by the way, here, hey, coffee's free. Bathrooms are free. <laughs> uh, sitting down in the chair is free. Most of our events, just come, enjoy, bless. We don't want anything from you. We want everything for you. We will teach you the blessings that come from a generous life and from honoring God. But um, that's not what we're about. And then, the, and then the other reason why people don't like to go to church or, or is, is because what will happen with my kids? Because sometimes some churches don't put a lot of emphasis, or energy, or attention to how are we receiving the kids, the, the youth, the young people. And so here we have a team of Vertical Kids and VSM who love your kids. They teach them, they bless them, they encourage them. So I'll finish, I'll finish with this thought because my, my charge today was to, to just get you to understand God's heart for the lost. Um, you, some years ago, <laughs> some years ago, a story, I have a story. Um, my oldest son, Caleb, was probably about seven years old. And we went to Animal Kingdom, Disney World. And it happened to be the week where Pandora opened, which is a section of the park that was new that day, that week, the Avatar movie thing. And, and so when we went into that section, it was a sea of thousands and thousands of people. And we were like, oh, well, we gotta go because it's new. And, and so we parked the stroller in the stroller area. And then we're like walking in between people to try to get to this ride, wait in line for two hours and ride for a minute and a half. And we did that. And then when we got out of the line, it usually kind of leaves you out like in a gift shop and then you kind of walk out. So we had to go back to the, to the stroller and we told all the kids, hey, stay close to us. There's a lot of people. So we started kind of going through the people. You know, they would usually grab onto us, you know, like train and moving. It was just Lane, me, our three kids and a, and a friend and one of the kids' friends. And we were walking, 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 going through the people, getting through the people. We're like, oh, this is crazy, you know. Um, we finally get to the stroller. I'm putting Nico in the stroller, making sure the bag's there, everything's there. And all of a sudden, I hear just Len's voice say, where's Caleb? I turn around. I see everybody. I don't see Caleb. I turn around, and I see a sea of thousands of people. Mom and Dad, do you know what happens there with your heart? <laughs> doom, 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 doom. Okay, did you see him? Did you, was he holding? Was he with you? No, he was, I thought he was with you. I thought it was with you. No, where is he? And in that moment, I said, okay, stay here in case he's somewhere close by and comes back. I'm going back to the ride, to the exit, to see if he's there by the gift shop. So I run. But as I'm running, there's a sea of people. So I'm probably knocking people over. I'm running, Caleb, you know, I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking. I can't see anything. I'm running through the people, running through the people. Probably took me like three minutes to get there, to get back to where we were. And uh, I get back to the gift shop. I'm looking. I don't see anybody. There's tons of people coming out of the ride. I'm looking around for a kid. I don't see him anywhere. Do you know what like four minutes feels like when you don't have your kid with you, you know, when he's lost? So now I'm like, oh my gosh, have you seen a kid? Have you seen every mask? Have you seen a child? Have you seen a kid? No, no, no. People everywhere. So now I have to run back to where my wife is at. Another three or four minutes to get back between all of the people. Is he back? Did he come back? No, he's not here. Where is he? Oh my God. So you know all the things, thoughts that are going through your mind. Boom, 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 boom. So then I decide, I said, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in this other direction, kind of where the flow of the people were going to see if maybe I find them. And I, and I was going to try to try to find like a, like a worker or a security guard or something. And then I was running and I was screaming, Caleb, Caleb, Caleb. And then somebody at one point waved me and said, there's a kid over there crying. He's with a Disney worker. And, and where, where I go? So another, like probably about three or four minutes later, I get to him and I see him. And there's two thoughts in my mind. Number one is I'm going to kill him. And then number two, no, 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 I just found him. I need to embrace him. He was crying. I think he had a bag of corn nuts in his hands. I think the corn nuts distracted him. And uh, I gave him a big hug. And I said, I'm, 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 I'm here. He was crying. You know, you, know that, you know when it's like, you know that kind of guy. And I, and I grabbed him and I said, don't you ever leave our side again. Praise God. But can you imagine if in the middle of all that, I would have gone to security officer and said, hey, hey, my son is lost. And he said, hold on, I'm on my break. I'm going to finish this donut. Then I'll write down all the information. Can you imagine if that? Like, like I would have been like, forget you. Like, 
your inactivity would frustrate me because my child is lost. Are you following me? Or what if in the middle of trying to find my child, my daughter Sophia pulls my, my pants and she says, Daddy, can I have an ice cream? In that moment, I would say, Honey, I love you, but if you are not going to help me find your lost brother right now, get out of my way. Why? Because I was distracted with my lost child. And you and I have a hard time realizing that this is God's heart every single day. And sometimes we're here asking for ice cream. Oh God, I want this car. And, and oh Lord, I, you know, can you multiply this for my life? And all the time he's just saying, hey, 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 I love you. But would you help me find my lost kids? Would you help me seek and find my lost kids? In fact, your lost brothers and sisters. And I ask myself, do we have an urgency to reach the lost? Or are we worried about our donuts? Or are we so focused on other things that we have just become insensitive and not even aware? And when we come to church, it's all about, I hope they sing the song that I like. I hope pastor preaches the message that reaches my heart. And I hope it because it's all about me when, it's like, when, it's, when the question is, where are the lost kids that you're helping to bring to Jesus? And so that's what Sunday is about, at least here in this church. Why? Because there's so many lost people. I'm going to pray two prayers. The first one is for all of us to have a more sensitive heart to reach the lost because that's God's heart. And as a church, to do it more. And then the second prayer will be for anybody who doesn't know Jesus, anybody who's far from the Lord. Or maybe you say, you know what, I, I've been in and around church, but I realize today I think I'm lost. Well, you can be found today. Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word that teaches us, that encourages us, and that challenges us. I pray that you would help us have a greater urgency and passion to see more lost people come to know you. We pray for the seed of the gospel, the seed of salvation to land in the hearts of people that we know, family members, friends, neighbors, colleagues, classmates, teammates. I pray, Lord God, that we would be willing to share the message with all who are willing to listen. And I pray, Lord God, that as, as we plant seeds or maybe water them, we would trust that you would be the one that gives them growth. Help us be a church that always has an eyes open to the lost, to reach them and to eventually help them take steps and disciple them to see them grow and flourish in their spiritual walk. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.